This week, though, he and several ministers, including the deputy prime minister, will be speaking yet again from the West Block of Parliament Hill. And again, not from his cottage, Rideau Cottage, as, uh, as he has been doing. There is another announcement expected today, this one on guns, specifically uh, new restrictions to ban certain makes and models uh, of weapons with some specific characteristics, military style or assault, assault style weapons. I, I should point out that we will have full coverage of that for you, but this time, each day. Again, until just recently, this has been really about the pandemic and public health briefings. Uh, so that's why we've been carrying it in this way. That's an important part of, of you knowing more about the pandemic and how to deal with it in your community. But we will delve into this shift uh, for the government's focus today uh, with our reporters. And we will also get some opposition reaction from Andrew Scheer as soon as uh, the prime minister is done speaking. So I'll bring in my colleagues, uh, CBC's Catherine Cullen and the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas, to help us set this up. So uh, a bit of a change today for the prime minister. And I'm, I want to be really transparent about it because we have been covering this because obviously the announcements have been primarily about uh, COVID-19. And there is a, a huge importance to people getting that information, not to diminish what, what the prime minister and the government might be announcing today. But this is a uh, distinct change in, in what we're talking about. This is a different kind of policy that they are announcing. It is one that they promised during the, the election campaign, and it's one that they said they intended to bring before the pandemic started. Uh, and now perhaps, uh, you know, pushed, ahead, pushed faster because of the shooting in Nova Scotia, they are doing that today. Uh, Vashi, what, what do you think we should expect based on some of the reporting that we have done already this week? Yeah, I think it's important to set that backdrop as you've done though, Rosie, because uh, you know while this is a, a major uh, change in policy, all we've been hearing about, as you point out, is COVID-19 and policies related to that. This is the first shift away from, from it. This is something the government, actually the Liberals, started talking about well before the campaign and actually was asked to do or to act on by various municipal leaders. I'm thinking, for example, of Valerie Plante, the mayor of Montreal, as well as John Tory, the mayor of Toronto. And that happened a long time ago, f following pretty violent incidents in, in both Quebec, but also in Toronto. Uh, the government then conducted a series of consultations, which wrapped up a full year ago. From that point on, they promised some action on gun control. They got more specific in the campaign. Uh, they then, you know, re-announced that they were going to do the things that they did in the campaign towards the end of the year. The prime minister started getting questions on this again following what happened in Nova Scotia. Uh, he then, towards uh, the end of last week, I think, said, well, if we have some cooperation with the opposition parties or we might move fast, we, we might end up introducing something on this or doing something on this. He didn't directly tie the two, but he was at the time getting questions about what was happening in Nova Scotia. What we do anticipate today is that uh, the government will introduce a list that doesn't have to go through the legislative process that they can do through their own cabinet of specific military style assault weapons that they are looking to ban. What will be interesting to see, I think two things I'm watching for. First, our colleagues at the Globe and Mail are reporting that though they promised a full buyback program for those restricted weapons uh, in the campaign, that it instead will not be a full buyback program. And in fact, if you own one of them, one of those restricted uh, weapons, you will be allowed to keep them under current, uh, under sort of specific conditions. I don't know what the conditions are. I'm interesting to see, interested to see how that plays out because that certainly will anger some of the people who have been asking for uh, more severe gun control, but it might also appease people who were worried about new restrictions unfairly or unduly impacting law-abiding gun owners. The second part of this is the timing, and I think it is worth questioning. Uh, we have to remember in Nova Scotia, what we know from the RCMP so far is obviously the gunman had a, a strong arsenal of various weapons, but we are told that he had no license for them and that in fact most of them other than one came illegally from the United States. We don't know all the details about that arsenal. We don't know everything about how he obtained them, but that's the information we have so far, which, you know, also prompts the question, well, even if you're going to enact stricter gun control laws or restrict these weapons, that might not actually have, have made a difference in Nova Scotia. So I'm keen to see how the Prime Minister uh, explains the timing of this, this pivot away from COVID-19 related policy.
Yeah, I think it, it's also uh, worth mentioning some other reporting that uh, our colleague uh, J.P. Tasker and, and um, Emma Godmere did around uh, the previous piece of gun control legislation, Bill C-71, uh, which was passed through legislation in Parliament last year, but then had to be enacted um, in, in certain ways to pass into law. Um, and not everything happened uh, under, under that uh, piece of legislation. Uh, the government says that it was in part because an election got in the way, uh, and, and there were all sorts of timing issues. Uh, you know, that, that may be true, but they didn't even finish the first part of gun control that they had actually uh, legislated. They didn't put all those factors, those pieces in place before. Uh, so it'll be interesting as well to see whether there's a commitment today to finish up uh, Bill C-71. I'll also just mention before I bring in Catherine that uh, the Prime Minister is also scheduled to speak with uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand today, Jacinda Ardern, who of course uh, moved very quickly on gun control after a shooting took, uh, I believe, 51 lives in, in two mosques in New Zealand. So the, um, the pressure to act on policy, uh, whether it existed before or not, it is fairly uh, normal, I think, that, that uh, politicians are called on to act in the wake of uh, gun crimes, Catherine. I mean, that is sort of what happens, whether it's something you had promised before or not. There is usually um, a, an additional push to see some sort of change uh, with gun control after uh, a tragedy like we saw in Nova Scotia. Yeah, and it's particularly pertinent that you, men you mentioned that, Rosemary, because our colleagues at Radio Canada, of course, did obtain a list of the firearms that they believe are going to be banned. And the document that they looked at, our colleague uh, Louis Boulouin, actually does link the weapons that are going to be banned uh, to various shootings, right? Sandy Hook, New Zealand, as you just mentioned, Las Vegas, Orlando, the Moncton shooting, the Quebec City Mosque shooting, the Dawson College shooting. So certainly I think we can expect to see. It's clear that we will see in the rationale that the government presents today that when they talk about how they made these choices, um, some of the feelings in the wake of these shootings will come into it. I think it's also going to be interesting to see how they talk about that buyback program. program. It does explicitly say in the Liberal campaign material that they are going to be introducing a buyback program for all military-style assault rifles legally purchased in Canada. And as the Globe's reporting does point out, um, it puts them in a position where certainly people who are in favour uh, of firearms rights are not going to be happy with this announcement today in many ways. And we're already seeing some criticism from some Conservative MPs online about the, the timing of this and whatnot, but also that people, um, for instance, the group uh, that formed after the, the shooting at Polytechnic are not happy to not see a full buyback program. So it'd be very interesting to see what sort of political rationale the government offers for that. Yeah, uh, so we'll, so we'll wait to see if the, the, they do indeed confirm the Globe's reporting there. But the, the, the cost of the buyback program had been uh, slated at about $250 million, uh, although many people thought it could be much, much higher because there are a lot of uh, weapons in, in that list that uh, Louis got. It does actually give the number of, est the estimated number of weapons uh, that exist in this country. Okay, I'm going to stop just for a moment, if I can, to turn to some other news before this briefing gets underway uh, in about seven minutes' time. Because I did want to go back to the story uh, that the Prime Minister was out talking about at this time yesterday and that we continue, of course, to track as well as ships and, as ships and aircrafts continue to scan the waters off Greece for five Canadian Forces members that are missing, still missing, after that NATO helicopter crash. Murray Brewster is the senior defence writer with CBC News and he is with us again from Ottawa. So we did get the names um, and, and some pictures to put to the, the five people that are still missing, uh, Murray, but give us the latest on, on how how that search is going and how much longer it might go on to. Well, the search is continuing, Rosie, and as far as we know at the moment, uh, there has been nothing additional found in terms of uh, perhaps uh, survivors or even uh, remains, uh, or even in terms of the, the uh, impact equipment or, uh, or any kind of debris. It's not going to probably go on to too much longer because standard operating procedure for uh, for search and rescue is about 72 hours. Now, the, the water and weather conditions in uh, the region right now are reasonably calm, so that does give uh, rescuers hope. But uh, 72 hours is usually the maximum before they decide to turn and call it what they, a recovery operation. Now, some of the uh, obstacles to the recovery operation were outlined in yesterday's briefing by the Chief of the Defence Staff, and that is essentially some of the wreckage has been spotted perhaps as much as 3,000 metres down at the bottom of the ocean, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a rather large debris field. So that is going to make it 
very complicated for uh, any recovery operation to, uh, to take place. Um, whether the government is going to have to call in some extra help from allies is an open question right now. Last night, I had a conversation with uh, Sergeant Sajjan, the defense minister, prior to uh, filing to the national. And uh, he is saying that all options, such as calling in allies which have deep diving capability, are still on the table. So these are some of the things we're going to watch for in the prime minister's briefing today. Just, just another question about trying to understand what happened. Um, I, I understand they have the voice uh, data recorder and uh, another piece of equipment that they've already managed to recover. Um, beyond recovering the, 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 the bodies, the souls that were lost, how important would be uh, any debris in terms of giving us a sense of what actually happened? Well, it is very important because in most accident investigations and crashes, uh, the investigators try to essentially reassemble the aircraft. And that tells them an awful lot because it would tell them about, for instance, uh, it would give them an idea of the speed of the impact. Uh, it would give them uh, if there's a, a part missing or if there's a part dented in some particular way that is not related to the impact, that could say something about whether there was mechanical failure. So it's very important for them to collect as much uh, of the aircraft as they possibly can uh, before determining precisely what happened. Okay, Murray Brewster, thanks for all your hard work on this. We'll come back to you if you have uh, more updates for us. Thanks so much. Thanks. All right, we will uh, go back to my colleagues, uh, Vashi Capellas and Catherine Cullen, as we wait for the Prime Minister and a slew of ministers to come in today to speak to us, not about uh, the pandemic response, but a response of a different kind, and that is around gun control measures. I do want to take a minute, though, as we wait uh, for the Prime Minister to talk about the other announcement that happened earlier today at 9.30 with the Finance Minister and the Governor of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Polaz, and that was the announcement of the new Governor of the Bank of Canada, Tiff Macklem, uh, who will be in place at the beginning of June. Uh, and, and while uh, Mr. Macklem might not be a familiar person to everybody just now, he had been previously at the Bank of Canada and then left to become um, a, a dean at the business school in the University of Toronto. And this is, this is of particular importance to talk about it now, I think, because of the economic recovery that is on the other side of what we're dealing with now and how important the, the bank's monetary policy has been to trying to um, make sure that we come out of it with, with some chance of success. So it, it's good to know who the governor will be with once Mr. Polaz leaves, and it's good also to know that he didn't actually want to stay on. Um, and, and that's why I wanted to just spend a little bit of time on it, Vashi. Uh, Mr. Macklem does have experience with financial crises um, and certainly was asked some of those questions today too. Yeah, he was asked a lot of questions about the current crisis and, and how deep it is. And, and he, he definitely went into some detail about why he believed it was unprecedented and therefore why the response has to be unprecedented as well. My understanding is he spent decades at the Bank of Canada, so he's not a stranger to uh, the organization, but he stepped away, as you mentioned, to become the dean of the Rotman School of Management in Toronto. Uh, he was considered, I guess, for the top job because he served as the deputy governor, but passed over in 2013 for Stephen Polo. So it's interesting that the route back happened to be through, through outside the Bank of mm -hmm, Canada's mm -hmm. doors. Uh, on the question of sort of the significance of it at this juncture, I think you're absolutely right to point out it's almost different times. The monetary policy for the Bank of Canada, most especially in tough economic times, has proven to be obviously incredibly important. But we have seen over the past few months uh, a sort of almost uh, unique way of presenting that, uh, that sort of fix and alongside the finance minister is what I mean. We've seen a series of press conferences, for example, where the magnitude of the crisis is acknowledged by both of them, both Stephen Polos and Bill Morneau, sitting side by side, and then each sort of rolls out what the policy will be to try and bridge the gap or rectify the damage that's being done or will be done. Uh, and so this job that he's taking on right now is, is important in the best of times and in the worst of times, but in the extra, extra worst of times that we're in right now economically, <laughs> yeah. it's even more significant. And so I think some of the things that he talked about, for example, the, the magnitude of the crisis, the magnitude of the response, we don't know exactly what form that takes as far as the monetary policy is concerned, but we can expect it to be significant in an ongoing way. And that's not just important in the acute time we're in right now where we're feeling it so deeply, but also in the recovery. So Stephen Paulus has provided 
provided a prescription right now for the acute pain we're feeling, but Mr. Macklin is going to be providing a prescription for, you know, ripping the Band-Aid off and then trying to heal the wound. And I think uh, that will be very interesting to see how it might differ from the current set of policies that are, have put forth or what he means when he says unprecedented. Yeah, and right now the bank has done, uh, I mean, they've sort of run out of options, frankly, in terms of monetary policy. The, the next option would be to go into negative interest rates, what they were also asked about today. And Mr. Macklem as well said, you know, we'll do what is needed. It's also worth knowing about him uh, that he was, uh, I am told, one of four Canadians that were inside the room when the group of seven finance ministers made the decision back in the fall of 2008 to, to fully back the banking system, which was on the verge of collapse in the the world, as we know, uh, and Mr. Macklin was there with uh, Jim Flaherty at the time, as that dis as that decision was made, as they were discussing what that would mean and and how that uh, how that backing by banks uh, around the world would would try to you know manage the damage that that ended up being substantive. But this is on a totally different level, um, and I do think it's good for people to know that Mr. Macklin does have uh, that kind of experience with uh, a financial crisis as well. He does, though, uh, and I think we've only got about a minute, Catherine. He does, though, mm -hmm. it does mean that someone else who was at the bank didn't get the job, and that is a little bit of a surprise to some people, too. Well, I want to pick up on the point you were making a moment yeah. ago, though, because I think it's so relevant for the audience in terms of what's happening right now. I mean, he made the contrast, Tiff Macklin, this morning between what happened in 2008. He said that was a, a crisis within financial institutions. Now we are talking about uh -huh. a medical crisis. And he had something I thought quite pointed to say about how to deal with it. He said, you need to overwhelm a crisis. You need to think beyond the normal responses. You need to restore confidence and talked about the role that the bank can play uh, going forward, trying to be as transparent with Canadians as possible about what they think might happen. But he acknowledged, just as we hear from public health officials every day, there is so much that is unknown at this time that the bank will have to look at a multitude of scenarios. And he's calling for uh, bold action in the face of this, praising what the bank and the federal government have already done. Okay, good, good, appreciate that. And Carolyn Wilkins is the central bank's deputy, uh, senior deputy governor. She was one of the people we thought she might get the job. She will remain in her position. She also has been uh, critical to some of the monetary policy decisions that have been made over the past number of weeks. They've all been made very quickly. All right, here is the Prime Minister of Canada, accompanied with cabinet ministers, again, expecting today a different kind of announcement serve, about gun we'll policy from Mr. Trudeau. Here we go. Macklin, as the next governor of the Bank of Canada. Mr. Macklem, who is currently the Dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto, has extensive experience in the global financial system and risk management. With his appointment, the Bank of Canada will be well positioned to help with the economic response and eventual recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. I also want to note that May 1st marks the beginning of Asian and Jewish Heritage Month. Unfortunately, we've seen a rise in anti-Asian sentiment lately, and this week, two more anti-Semitic incidents took place. It's important to celebrate who we are at all times and not give in to hatred or fear. When times are tough, Canadians come together. That is who we are. Le 6 décembre, on December 6, 1989, I was in Montreal, in Cégep, at the bottom of the hill to Polytechnic. I couldn't tell you what I was studying that day, but I will never forget the moment when I heard the first reports of a shooting at Polytechnic. At first, I was shocked. I was 17 years old, and I couldn't understand that such an act of violence towards women, women could happen in a country such as ours, in a society such as ours. Every Canadian has their version of this story. Every one of us remembers the day when we realized that even in Canada, a man with a gun could irrevocably alter our lives for the worse. We remember how our sense of safety was shaken, how our worldview was changed. École Polytechnique, Mayerthorpe, Dawson College, Moncton, La Loche, La Grande Mosquée de Québec, The Danforth, Fredericton, and 
Cumberland, Colchester, and Hants counties, Nova Scotia. These tragedies reverberate still. They shape our identity. They stain our conscience. They make adults out of children. And the heartbreaking truth is they're happening more often than they once did. With each passing year, more families are ripped apart by tragedy. More parents are struggling to explain the inexplicable to their kids. And more teenagers are growing up in a world where gun violence is normalized. It needs to stop. Last week, 22 Canadians were killed in the deadliest rampage in our country's history. They were nurses and teachers, correctional officers and RCMP officers. They were someone's child, someone's best friend, someone's partner. Their families deserve more than thoughts and prayers. Canadians deserve more than thoughts and prayers. Lors des dernières élections, nous nous sommes engagés à During the last elections, we committed to banning assault-style weapons and we put in place a program to buy back these weapons. We announced our intention to work with the provincial and territorial governments in order to allow municipalities to ban handguns. We also promised to take other measures in order to save lives. In October, Canadians confided in their elected officials a clear mandate to restrict the use of these weapons in Canada, and we intend to maintain our engagement. For military-grade assault weapons in Canada. We are banning 1,500 models and variants of these firearms by way of regulations. These weapons were designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time. There is no use and no place for such weapons in Canada. For many families, including many Indigenous people, firearms are part of traditions passed down through generations, and the vast majority of gun owners use them safely, responsibly, and in accordance with the law, whether it be for work, sport shooting, for collecting, or for hunting. But you don't need an AR-15 to bring down a deer. So, Effective immediately, it is no longer permitted to buy, sell, transport, import, or use military-grade assault weapons in this country. To protect law-abiding gun owners from criminal liability until they can take steps to comply with this new law, there will be a two-year amnesty period and we will legislate fair compensation. Now, I want to take a moment to recognize the leadership of Minister Blair on this file. Tackling gun violence has been a personal and professional priority of his for decades. He's done incredible work to make this policy a reality, and we are here today thanks to his leadership and to the leadership of people like him. Merci, Bill. Aujourd'hui, nous fermons Today, we are closing the market on military-grade assault weapons in Canada. We are banning 1,500 models and variants of this type of firearm. These, are, these weapons were used for one goal, killing the largest amount of people as quickly as possible. They have no use and have no place here in Canada. Throughout the country, many people use firearms legally and responsibly for work or for hunting, but you don't need an AR-15 in order to shoot a deer. So, from this moment on, it is no longer permitted to sell, to buy, to transport, to import or to use military-grade assault weapons in Canada. In order to protect 
de toute responsabilité criminelle. Responsible owners from criminal liability, there will be a two-year amnesty period so that they can comply to these new regulations. We have the intention of tabling a bill in order to ensure fair compensation shortly. An entire generation of Canadians will remember exactly where they were on Sunday, April 18th, 2020. They will remember how their sense of safety was shaken, how their outlook on the world was forever changed. They will remember the day that they lost some of their innocence. This chapter in our history cannot be rewritten, but what happens next is up to us. We can stick to thoughts and prayers alone, or we can unite as a country and put an end to this. We can decide together that enough is enough. Today's announcement builds on the things we did during our first term. It's the next step. And there is more work ahead to implement this and pass legislation to further strengthen our laws. I've already spoken with the other parliamentary leaders, and I know that we will be able to work together and do even more to keep Canadians safe. Every single Canadian wants to see less gun violence and safer communities. So today, we take another big step forward. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, and good morning, everyone. Uh, before I begin my remarks, I'd like to take the opportunity to extend my sincere condolences to the families of those that were lost in the heli helicopter crash off the coast of Greece on Wednesday. We will always remember their service and their sacrifice. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today for what I believe to be a very significant and yet solemn occasion. A few weeks ago, in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Canada suffered its worst mass shooting in the country's history. 22 innocent lives were lost over the course of a weekend rampage across beautiful communities throughout Nova Scotia. Canadians were shocked and they were heartbroken. And as we learned the identities of the victims of these terrible crimes, we were reminded of the tragic impact that gun violence can have on all of our communities urban and rural, from coast to coast to coast. Mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, friends and neighbours were taken from us terribly, violently and far too soon. And sadly, gun violence is not a new thing in our society, but it's made all the more deadly with the proliferation of firearms that are more powerful than ever before. Assault-style firearms, those that were not designed for hunting or sport shooting, but they have become more and more prevalent in our Canadian retail market. And for as long as these guns have existed, they have been capable of inflicting tremendous damage when they fall into the wrong hands. And for example, in 1989, 14 women were murdered at Ecole Polytechnique in a horrific act of deadly misogyny. 17 years later, Montreal was shaken yet again with the shooting at Dawson College. In 2014, Moncton ter was terrorized by a criminal that took the lives of three RCMP officers. And three years ago, in January, in saint foy Quebec, a shooter killed six innocent Muslims while they were in prayer. Many of us have vivid and tragic memories of each of these events. They have become, sadly, a part of our history, these tragic moments when innocent women, worshippers, police officers, and innocent Canadians across the country have been killed by evil people wielding powerful guns. For decades, chiefs of police, advocacy groups, grieving families, and everyday Canadians have been calling for a ban of these types of firearms, guns that were designed for soldiers to kill other soldiers, and not for recreational purposes. Guns that belong on a battlefield, and not on our streets. Guns that were designed to kill people. They were intended in their purpose to kill people, and they have been used in Canada to kill innocent people. And for decades, Canadians have been calling upon successive governments for reform, for stronger gun control. And we have listened. And today, we are taking action. Today, as the Prime Minister has said, we are announcing an immediate ban on over 1,500 models of assault-style firearms, 
and effective immediately. These newly banned firearms cannot be legally used, sold, or imported in our country. And as of today, the market for assault weapons in Canada is closed. Enough is enough. And we are ending the proliferation of these weapons and the militarization of our society. From this moment forward, the number of these guns will only decrease in Canada. We've heard many people express concern about the militarization of our police, and this is a direct consequence of the militarization of society. And Canadians deserve to live in a society where they can be safe and secure. And people from coast to coast have been clear. We cannot risk another shooting at a school or a place of worship or another attack on police officers or on women or on innocent Canadians anywhere in this country. Banning assault-style firearms will save Canadian lives. I'd like to take a moment, if I may, to speak to the law-abiding Canadian gun owners. I know from very many years of experience as a police officer that the overwhelming majority of gun owners in this country are law-abiding. They are responsible. They are conscientious. They acquire their weapons legally, they store them securely, and they use them safely. They respect our laws, and we respect them. I want to assure hunters and farmers and target shooters in this country that nothing that we are doing today or will do in the future is intended to interfere with this lawful, responsible and legal activity. However, we are today ending the availability of weapons that were not designed for hunting or for target shooting. They were rather designed for soldiers to kill other soldiers. And while I appreciate that some may feel that these weapons have some recreational value, the tragic reality is that these weapons were designed to kill people and have been used to kill innocent Canadians. Public safety must always be our first priority. And these powerful firearms become deadly weapons when they fall into the wrong hands. Protecting human life must come above all else. These guns have no legitimate civilian purpose. They don't belong in our communities. And I will also say that the, the banning of these assault weapons is an important step but let me also acknowledge that we know that there is much more to do. We will introduce legislation at the first opportunity to fulfill our commitments to Canadians, to keep guns out of the hands of criminals, by strengthening our storage laws, by preventing drug tra gun trafficking and smuggling. We will bring in greater control of ammunition and magazine capacities. And perhaps most importantly, we will bring in red flag laws that allow law enforcement to remove firearms from dangerous situations to make sure that they don't become deadly. We will empower victims, communities, doctors, families. We will empower Canadians to render their situation safe. And where there is firearms in a situation that could be dangerous, we know that situation can become deadly. And red flag laws will empower us to keep Canadians safe. We will do all of these things. And we will keep working hard to make our streets safer for our kids and grandkids. I would remind us all that over the last four years, we have taken real measures to strengthen gun control. We've invested over $327 million to fight gun and gang violence. That meant, for example, more resources for local law enforcement to investigate gang-related activity. It meant funding for projects which were focused on things like keeping kids in school, giving support to victims of human trafficking, and preventing grant gang recruitment. We brought in Bill C-71, which, among other measures, strengthens background checks to help ensure guns don't end up in the wrong hands. And last year, in the fall, we campaigned on a promise to do more. Today, we are moving forward on our promise and our plan to deliver safer streets and stronger communities for generations to come. Canada can know a future with less gun violence and less tragedy. By taking action today, we can give our kids and our, our grandkids a better chance at a brighter, safer tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Merci. Bon matin. Je suis je suis fier d'être ici en présence du premier ministre et de mes collègues. I'm proud to be here with my colleagues and the prime minister to talk about important measures that we are putting in place. We know that the number of crimes committed with firearms has increased over the past years. In 2017, there were 2,500 additional victims than in 2013. We have seen cases where weapons that were designed for use on the battlefield have made their way into our community 
and have been used to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Minister Blair mentioned tragic incidents that live in the mind of all Canadians. Mothers and fathers, children, friends and neighbours whose lives were taken in senseless acts of violence. En tant que Montréalais, mais surtout en tant que père as a Montrealer, but also as a father of two daughters and family member of a former Polytechnic student, I can tell you that the shooting of 14 young women in Polytechnic is very fresh in our collective memory, even 30 years and later. Remember Anastasia de Souza, whose promising life was tragically cut short at Dawson College. La tristesse et la terreur que nous avons tous ressenti ont été We felt sadness and terror, and this allowed us to have a more strict regulation of firearms. The Firearms Act put in place new regulations in 1995. In 2019, Canadians gave us a clear mandate to act. As Minister Blair explained, today we are moving forward with this commitment by announcing an immediate prohibition of over 1,500 makes and models of military-style firearms. Ce sont des armes à feu de calibre militaire. These are military caliber, military grade firearms that were created in order to have the most victims as quickly as possible. These weapons are effective immediately. We are, however, taking reasonable steps to provide Canadians with the time and guidance to properly and safely deactivate or remove these items from their possession. To do this, we are putting in place an amnesty order under the Criminal Code, beginning today and effective until April 30th, 2022. This amnesty period will give a lawful owner in possession of these newly prohibited firearms a reasonable time frame to come into compliance without facing criminal liability for unlawful possession. By the end of this amnesty period, all Canadians must be in compliance with the law. Il y a des règles claires sur ce qui est permis. There are clear laws on what is allowed and what is not allowed during this amnesty period. Anyone in possession of these newly prohibited firearms can no longer use them, even during the amnesty period. Secondly, these firearms cannot be imported or sold to individuals in Canada. Third, these firearms can be legally exported during the two-year time frame with a valid export permit. In addition, a business owner may return the firearm to its manufacturer. Finally, these firearms must be safely stored in accordance with the law. They can only be trans transferred or transported for the purposes of deactivation, export, with a permit, or surrender to police without compensation, or if the person is not the owner of the firearm, to return the firearm to its rightful owner. There will be an exception for Indigenous peoples exercising a Section 35 hunting right, as well as those who use the weapon for hunting to feed themselves or their family. They may continue using firearms that were previously non-restricted for these purposes, until a suitable replacement can be acquired. We are asking that no one attempt to surrender their firearm while social distancing because of COVID-19 is being practiced. As I have indicated, at the end of the amnesty period, all firearm owners will have to be in compliance with the prohibition. Le caractère de nation est défini the character of a nation is defined by how it reacts to tragedies. Our country is more united than ever, and we need to continue to work together. The measures that we are announcing today are banning the most dangerous weapons, which represent the most significant threat to Canadian communities. That is what we promised to Canadians, and we owe it to them and to all of the victims who lost their lives too soon. Thank you.
Bonjour tout le monde, Monsieur le Premier everyone. ministre, chers collègues. Mr. Prime Minister, colleagues, we are all fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic, but we had the worst shooting in our country. 22 people died at the hands of a heartless gunman. Canadians shared the burden felt by our comrades in Nova Scotia, and we understand the impact of armed violence in our communities. And this is nothing new. But what is new, however, is that this violence is more violent because of the proliferation of guns that are more violent and more lethal. They have no use for guns or sport. These weapons can kill too many too quickly. In 89, there was the Polytechnique shooting. In 2006, Dawson. In 2014, Moncton. And on January 22, 2017, there was Sainte-Foy. A young man killed six brothers, fathers. Motives can change from one tragedy to another. The context can change. The targets of these killers can change, their MO can change, but there are two things that remain the same. There are always innocent victims who leave behind an emptiness that cannot be filled in the hearts of their loved ones. Also, we cannot change the fact that there are weapons that are maimed to kill, and these are weapons that we are going to be banning today. Chiefs of police, Families, citizens have been asking for the prohibition of these weapons that were created for warfare and not for civilians in our communities. Today, we are acting, we are acting for the future. We are banning more than 1,500 types of military-grade assault weapons. Today marks the end of the market for these weapons. But with, before moving forward with this, we need to remind everyone that most gun owners in Canada are law-abiding gun owners and take all the measures necessary to ensure that their weapons are used and kept securely. However, these weapons are deadly and pose too great a risk when they fall into the hands of the wrong people and the safety of the public is paramount. The measures that we are putting in place today will save lives. We also know that a ban is a part of the equation to, re to reduce armed violence in Canada. We also need to take on contraband of these weapons of handguns. We need to take on street gangs. We need to invest in prevention. And we need to have more education, more support in mental health. The work has started, and we are going to continue it. We started by investing $327 million over five years to counter gang and gun violence. We will be adopting C-71 that verifies the criminal history of buyers to make sure that weapons do not fall into the wrong hands. And today, we are going one step further, one significant step further, a historic step further that will save lives and make our societies safer for all. Thank you. Good morning. I grew up on a farm in northern Alberta. We had guns on our farm, and we still do, as on many farms across our country. If there were bears around, my dad would keep a gun in his truck, and sometimes he'd hunt prairie chickens on his way home for supper. And you know what? Neither my dad nor any other farmer I knew then or have known since owned an assault rifle or an assault-style rifle. And that's because those weapons are not for hunting. They aren't for shooting a prairie chicken or scaring off a bear. They're designed for only one purpose, to kill people and to look like they can kill people. Lorsque nous réfléchissons au massacre when we reflect on the massacre of the 14 women at Polytechnique or the shooting at Dawson or at the horrible tragedy that occurred in Nova Scotia at Portapique 12 days ago. 
This reinforces our determination. On the massacre of 14 women at the Ecole Polytechnique in 1989, or the Dawson College shooting in 2006, or the horrible tragedy in Porta Peak, Nova Scotia, just 12 days ago. Those heinous acts strengthen our resolve. And that resolve is to close the gaps in our gun control laws and to keep the most dangerous firearms out of civilian hands. We neither need nor want such weapons in our homes, in our pickups, in our communities, or on our streets. These guns make it easier to commit mass murder. And the culture around their fetishization makes our country inherently more dangerous for the people most vulnerable. And that is women and girls. Chaque femme et chaque fille qui nous écoute aujourd'hui to all the women and girls, they all have a story to tell about a moment where they felt vulnerable or in danger. It is unacceptable that in 2020 that gender is still a factor that determines whether or not you feel safe at home and in your community. Every woman and girl listening today remembers a time when she was made to feel unsafe, vulnerable, or in harm's way. We all know what that's like. It's unacceptable that in 2020, gender continues to be a determining factor in whether you feel safe in your home or on your street. During this pandemic, we are particularly concerned about the rise in gender-based and domestic violence. Frontline organizations have seen a surge in appeals from women and children fleeing violence. British Columbia's Battered Women's Support Services has received 300% more calls since the beginning of the pandemic. A Toronto-based shelter has seen a 400% increase in demand for shelter. And unfortunately, this isn't new. From 2010 to 2015, according to statistics compiled by the Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative, there were 418 cases of domestic homicide in Canada, with 476 victims. Of the 427 adult victims, 79% were women. Let that number sink in. In 2019, according to the Canadian Femicide Observatory for Justice and Accountability, 118 women and girls died violently in Canada. On average, one every three days. Again, let that number sink in. Nous savons également we also know that the availability of these firearms is a danger to vulnerable populations like women, queer and trans folk, Indigenous people and people of colour, women, girls, two-spirited people who were assassinated or missing or one of the most significant examples, and it's a clear tragedy because of the violence in our country. Assault-style weapons puts vulnerable populations, women, queer and trans people, Indigenous people, and people of colour at particular risk. The missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people are for me, one of the starkest and most tragic examples of systemic violence in our society. Tackling systemic violence is our collective responsibility, one that requires us to challenge our attitudes, strengthen community support, ensure accountability for perpetrators, 
and, critically, keep deadly weapons out of their hands. La féminicide est un fléau dans notre société. Femicide is a serious problem in our society. And we need to put an end to it. Femicide has long been a scourge in our society. It remains a scourge. We must stop it. In saying no to assault-style weapons, we are putting feminist ideas into practice. We are acting to ensure that our sisters, our mothers, our grandmothers, our daughters, and we ourselves, indeed, that all women who have been victimized, frightened, threatened, harmed, brutalized, and killed by gun violence have not suffered in vain. Enough is enough. Assez, c'est assez. Enough is enough. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Vice-Première Ministre. On va passer Thank à la you. période de questions, commençant par le téléphone aujourd'hui. Question period, starting uh, with the phone. Thank Operator. You. Merci. Première question, Michel Lamarche, TVA Nouvelle. À vous. Oui, bonjour. C'est une question. question. Yes, Trudeau. I have a question for Mr. Trudeau regarding the emergency plan on COVID-19. We are receiving lots of emails from seniors saying that they are suffering, that they need fin financial assistance. When will there be a plan to help seniors? They are waiting for this. Protéger les plus vulnérables dans cette Protecting situation de crise. The most vulnerable in this crisis has always been one of our priorities. And we know that seniors are more vulnerable to COVID-19. That is why, from the beginning, we took measures to help our seniors. But indeed, we do have more to do. We are working with the other parties, and we are working with people in the field in order to send help to the most vulnerable seniors, and we will be doing so shortly. Protecting the most vulnerable has always been uh, an essential element uh, and the core of our response to COVID-19. Uh, and obviously, our seniors, our elders, uh, are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. That's why we put forward a number of uh, measures from the beginning, um, but why we will continue to work on supporting our vulnerable seniors. So, another question. Can we expect a plan next week? And I have a question regarding the CERB. There are companies that aren't finding people to work because people are continuing to apply for CERB. It is more beneficial for them. Are you going to try to do something to help these entrepreneurs? Answer. Our priority is to ensure the health and safety of Canadians against COVID-19. That is why we put in place measures to encourage people to stay home, to protect themselves, and we want to protect our health care workers. We want, through these measures, to regain control in our country. Our our next steps will be to examine how to open, reopen the economy, and we want to make sure that people can work safely, and we will do so. Thank you. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Charlie Pinkerton, iPolitics. Line open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Will you explain how what your government is announcing today, how it will implement it without passing new legislation through Parliament? What is being done today uh, is being done entirely through regulations. That is a tool we have. But to move forward on the next steps, uh, including uh, an eventual buyback program, uh, we will need to move forward uh, through legislation in the House, uh, and we will be adding further measures to that as well. I have spoken with uh, uh, all other parliamentary leaders, uh, and I am confident that we will have the support necessary to move forward on strengthening gun legislation in this country. Country, uh, when the time comes for us to uh, move forward on legislation other than COVID-19. So 
if it can do what it's doing today without legislation, why was your government not proactive instead of reactive, and why did not uh, put these in force earlier? Um, I will I turn to uh, Minister Blair to, to answer that. But uh, we were ready to move forward uh, about a month ago. Uh, we had been planning uh, to do it in the uh, in the late uh, weeks of March. Uh, obviously, COVID became a priority for all of us, uh, particularly the Minister of Public Safety, who was uh, concerned with borders, concerned with uh, uh, public safety on multiple levels, uh, and we focused on that. But uh, obviously, it remained and remains a priority priority for us to move forward, and that is why we are moving forward today. Bill? Uh, yes, Prime Minister. Just to, to explain, there was a great deal of work that needed to be done, even though this is accomplished through regulation. We've been working very closely with the Attorney General and, and the Justice Department in the drafting of those regulations. Um, there, there were a number of very significant issues uh, to, to be addressed. Um, we are all highly motivated by our, our commitments to keep people safe, and certainly the tragedy 12 days ago just deepened our resolve um, to, to move forward as quickly as possible. But we have been working quite uh, diligently over the past uh, several months in order to draft the regulations that bring forward these measures today. And as the Prime Minister has also indicated, there remains a great deal more work to do. And so at the very first opportunity, we'll be bringing forward legislation that will complete the work that we begin today through regulation by facilitating, and Parliament will determine, um, a number of different imp important measures on, on how we can move forward, as the Prime Minister has indicated, with um, a safe, effective and responsible buyback program but it also enable us to take additional measures that will significantly improve public safety, um, strengthen gun control regulations. This today is a very f important first step, and it's a, a step that we have been working on over several months. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question, Catherine Lévesque, La Presse canadienne. À vous. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur question. Trudeau. Uh, yes, je, je hello, Mr. Trudeau. I have a question regarding the timing of this announcement. We are today May 1st. Canadians are wondering whether or not they will be able to pay their bills. Small businesses are wondering whether or not they will even be able to survive. Why did you think that it would be a good moment to announce these measures on assault weapons, even during this pandemic, even though the society, even though society has slowed down or stopped, we have noticed the impacts of firearms. We noticed that 12 days ago. That is why it's always a good time to go forward with ensuring the safety of Canadians. We've been working hard for weeks to keep Canadians safe through COVID-19, but there are other things that need to be done, and that is why we moved forward with increased gun control, and that is why we are banning assault-style Assault, military-grade assault weapons. In which we are very much focused on uh, keeping Canadians safe from COVID-19, but even amid uh, this um, terrible pandemic, uh, we have seen the impact uh, that someone with a gun uh, can have in devastating uh, the lives of uh, family members of communities uh, in our country. That's why uh, it is always uh, a good moment to move forward on measures that keep Canadians safe, and that is why uh, we are moving forward uh, with this today. Christian? I would like to add, Mr. Prime Minister, stated by Chrystia Freeland, that with physical distancing, our vulnerable population is more vulnerable than ever. Women and girls are seeing increased impacts of domestic violence, and this is why we need now more than ever these new rules. Thank you. Operator, last question on the phone, please. Merci. Next question, Jim Bronskill, the Canadian Press, line open. Uh, yes, uh, for Minister Blair. 
some say uh, that uh, one of the steps that must be taken to ensure uh, that guns remain uh, out of the hands of the people who should not have them are better screening and enforcement of prohibition orders when uh, there are flags that someone should not have a gun due to men mental illness or criminal history, and that uh, there's now uh, quite a uh, range of discretion among officials in the justice system to uh, whether to enact such a prohibition. Uh, will the government move on that factor? Thank you very much, Jim. And it's, a, it's an important question. And I, I made reference earlier to um, the legislation that we intend to bring forward at the first opportunity. And, and I mentioned in particular that it includes um, a commitment to uh, introduce red flag laws. And those are situations where an individual um, either represents a significant danger to themselves, perhaps an individual who might be suicidal, or someone who is um, involved in a, in a domestic violence and intimate partner relationship, um, w w whereas there's a significant significant risk to, to that individual. And we have also seen, unfortunately, people in our society who are advocating hate and advocating violence against religious minorities or women or other vulnerable populations. And, and so we want to make sure that we have the, the, the tools uh, to enable not just the police, but society, to victims, advocates, parents, teachers, to take the steps that are necessary to render that situation safe. And that's to remove firearms from that potentially dangerous situation and also to suspend that individual's uh, ability to get uh, to get access to guns, um, I, w there is there is a work that we have done in Bill C-71 uh, to 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 strengthen background checks to make sure that individuals who should not have access to firearms don't get them. But we are we are going to take additional steps to keep them safe. Um, those prohibition orders to be effective have to be respected and they have to be enforced. And there has to be consequences for those those who don't uh, obey them. And we are in, that's why we are intending to strengthen our gun control and our gun laws to keep Canadians safe. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Uh, there's been some discussion about how the uh, C-71 provisions, uh, some key elements have not yet come into force. Uh, can you give us a timeline for that? I realize uh, COVID-19 may have uh, disrupted that and that uh, I understood there were budgetary considerations uh, and other uh, factors why they may, may not be in place yet. But can you give us a timeline for uh, the taking of effect of the, the provisions in C-71? Yeah, of course, Jim. And, and, and I will tell you, C-71 was a very significant uh, step forward uh, in, our, in our last parliament by our government uh, to introduce legislation that will have a very positive effect in keeping people safe. And there, are, there remain a number of, of elements of C-71 which we are in the process of, of implementing, and they are important. Um, you know, notwithstanding that uh, we, we have been uh, very occupied, obviously, in our response to COVID-19, uh, that, that response has been entirely about keeping keep Canadians safe. And unfortunately, during this particular pandemic, we have not, although we've seen a change in a lot of society and even a reduction in, in a number of different types of crimes, we have not seen a reduction in gun violence. We have not seen a reduction in, in, in domestic violence. And in fact, because of some of the social distancing and social isolation rules that are in place, that risk that potential harm has actually been exacerbated. And so we're highly mo motivated to move forward. Um, I Let me assure you and all Canadians, the implementations of those important measures on B C Bill C-71 remain a, a high priority for us. There is much that we are working on now to, to, towards implementation. There are some additional budgetary measures um, that, that will need to be implemented, and that will require the consent of Parliament. But when we're ready, we'll move forward as quickly as possible. Bonjour, M. Trudeau, Louis Blouin, Radio-Canada. Selon les informations dont on dispose, Radio-Canada, Radio your government did not opt for, an, uh, for ça, a mandatory buyback program. Armes, uh, that means that weapons that are targeted today privées. could still be Comment found in private residences. How will you ensure that these weapons will not be used to commit a violent crime? All buyback programs will need to be made into bills, and so we will have to work with the other parties, with different groups throughout the country, to make sure that this buyback program be the best one, that it be fair, and we want it to have the necessary impact.
things are still being ironed out. Today's announcement means that from now on, military-grade assault weapons cannot be used in Canada, and the next steps still need to be ironed out. The measures we took today uh, ensure that uh, the use, the purchase, the uh, sale of military-style assault weapons in this country end today. The numbers of those military-style assault weapons in this country will only go down from here. Uh, designing uh, an appropriate and fair and effective buyback program is something that we will do as part of a legislative requirement, uh, and we will therefore be working with other parties in the House, with stakeholders across the country, uh, to ensure that it is done right uh, to be both effective uh, and impactful in keeping Canadians safe. Donc, juste pour être certain, euh, vous n'êtes pas encore fixé à savoir Question. si ce sera so, obligatoire ou pas. Par ailleurs, est-ce que vous avez l'intention de voir le, le régime de classification also, des armes pour empêcher qu'un fabricant puisse mettre un nouveau modèle sur la liste so that a manufacturer sur cannot create a new model that would go to market and that would circumvent the list that you put forward today. Answer. I'm going to give the floor to Minister Blair, who will be able to add to my answer. One of the biggest challenges in our weapons classification system system is that manufacturers of weapons can create variations of these weapons that circumvent the classification system that we have. One of the things that we're going to do moving forward is to ensure that this classification system be constantly updated. We want to follow what is happening in the market for these weapons. That way, we'll always be up to date and we will always be able to protect Canadians. One of the things that we are uh, looking at right now is ensuring that uh, our system of classification of of, uh, of firearms uh, is uh, ever-evolving, that keeps up with uh, modifications brought in by manufacturers, keeps up with uh, new variants and uh, new technologies. Uh, we need to make sure that we are constantly updating and ensuring uh, our class uh, updating our classification system to ensure that Canadians are kept safe. Uh, Bill, you have uh, perhaps a couple of questions. Actually, you've, you've covered it very well, Prime Minister. Our intent is to keep it evergreen. When the classification system was implemented, in the late 90s, it, the system that was put in place was rigid and inflexible, and it kind of let us down because, quite frankly, the manufacturers brought in a number of different variants that got around the, those, those classifications. We will put a legislative framework in place in, in the legislation that we'll bring forward that will create a new ever, evergreen framework for classification so that as new weapons are introduced into the market, uh, Canada will be able to respond quickly to ensure that only those weapons which are safe for use in this country will be available to Canadians. Hi, uh, Tom Parry with CBC. Uh, the shooter in Nova Scotia was using illegal weapons, and a lot of illegal weapons come in from the United States. So why not target those weapons as opposed to going after lawful gun owners? Um, today, we are banning military-style assault weapons in this country, uh, weapons that are designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to kill as many people as possible in as short amount of time as possible. Those guns have no place in Canada, and the measures we're putting forward uh, will uh, reduce the amount of those guns in Canada and eventually uh, you know, keep more Canadians safe. Uh, but there is more to do. Uh, there are uh, more uh, measures to take, and we look forward to moving forward on those. And for those, I'll turn it back to uh, Minister Blair. If, if, if I may, first of all, the responsibility for, for identifying the weapons that were used in Nova Scotia is with the RCMP, and 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 it's a, and the release of any information pertaining to those uh, is theirs. But I can tell you that every. Uh, firearm begins legally and then moves into an illegal market. And, and I can say with some confidence that the two long guns that were involved in that investigation without identifying them are included on today's list. Hi, Crystal Logue with Global News. Prime Minister, regarding the new gun measures, can you confirm if you plan to ban all military, or sorry, all automatic rifles? And why not look at banning handguns? They are causing more deaths in Canada every year. Um, 
Today we're moving forward with a ban on military-style assault weapons. Uh, we have uh, established criteria that cover about 1,500 models and variants of those guns that are uh, in Canada or available uh, to Canadians. Uh, this will make sure that uh, we uh, have safer communities as of uh, today and in the months and years to come. Uh, at the same time, there is more to do on strengthening gun control. We made a significant commitments to Canadians back in 2015 and moved forward on, on them uh, in the last mandate. And we're continuing to move forward on the commitments to strengthen gun uh, control in this country, including uh, allowing cities and municipalities the ability uh, to restrict the use of handguns. Uh, these are things that we will move forward on uh, in the coming months uh, as uh, the parliamentary uh, calendar returns to dealing with things other than COVID-19. Okay. Uh, nous avons pris des mesures concrètes pour bannir, uh, à partir d'aujourd'hui, les armes militaires. Uh, we have taken concrete measures to ban military-style assault pays. weapons that do not have their place in this country. We recognize that it's only one step of all of the things that we need to do regarding handguns and other things. We also need to fight domestic violence. We will continue to increase gun control in this country. And in order to do so, we will need to go through Parliament, and we will do this work once the government is able to focus on something other than COVID-19. CTV National News, you talked about this two-year amnesty period for people, to law-abiding gun owners, to, to give back these guns on this list. Does that mean that Canadians that don't comply would be fined or arrested? And how much will you compensate people that give back these firearms? Bill? A, a couple of questions, and I think the Attorney General could probably give you the details of the amnesty. Um, but, but, but essentially, it's, it's, it's a non-permissive uh, amnesty, which, which as the prime, as the attorney general has already explained, um, would allow a person who lawfully acquired these firearms to continue for a two-year period uh, to retain possession of them. But during that two-year period, they can't use them, they can't go hunting with them, they can't take them to the range and shoot them, they can't sell them or transfer them, transfer them. Um, it, it is very restrictive on, on what they can actually do with the weapon, and it will have to be stored securely uh, in, in, a, in a properly and approved vault during that period of time. The two-year period of amnesty um, enables us to bring forward legislation to, that with, with a safe and effective buyback program um, that will allow those individuals who lawfully acquire these things. One of the things we're trying to avoid, the Canadians who purchased these guns did so legally. And we did not want to create a situation by prohibiting them all moving forward of, of putting those people in criminal jeopardy. And so we have implemented a period of amnesty to allow us to bring forward legislation and a program that will enable those Canadians who originally purchased these guns to, to dispose of them and, and, and not to put themselves in, to be placed in a position of criminal jeopardy. You know, I, I, as I said, we respect Canadians who obey the law, and the law quite appropriately is now changed. And so we will do the work necessary and work with them to rent, bring them into a law, a lawful situation, and for all Canadians, a safer si situation by the elimination of these weapons in our society. Thank you. The, the standard criminal code provisions still apply. This is a, this is a regulation. Uh, uh, that that uh, derives from the criminal code, so the the, the same uh, the same structure fines and penalties that exist for other firearms violations exist here. Uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, the amnesty is also a regulation that does give uh, that non permissive period uh, where uh, one can, in a very limited way, uh, transport uh, the weapons for certain reasons, but otherwise can't use them. Compensation. That will be determined, as we've said, uh, through a, a buyback uh, program that we'll have to do through Parliament. I mean, that, that requires a, a budget, that requires a law, and so we will require the usual parliamentary processes and safeguards, I might add, uh, moving forward again with the cooperation and collaboration of, of uh, our partners in the House of Commons. 
Um, it's May 1st, hard to believe, but it is May 1st, and rent is due for Canadians across the country. We know that uh, the CERB has helped uh, many people, uh, but they have to choose, especially in big cities, Prime Minister, between do I pay my rent or do I get groceries this month? It's just not enough. Uh, I know this is provincial jurisdiction, but your government has stepped in for commercial renters here. Is there anything more you can do to help regular Canadian renters out there who can't pay their bills today? From the very first, um, our focus through this COVID-19 crisis has been uh, ensuring that Canadians who are vulnerable because of uh, a loss of a paycheck or loss of a job, uh, who don't have money coming in to be able to pay their rent or pay their groceries, uh, get a, a reliable source of income. And that's why we move forward with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Uh, that's why we are uh, moving forward with the, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, uh, so that people actually can uh, rely on uh, money coming in uh, to pay their everyday, everyday needs, uh, which include groceries and rent. Uh, we have moved forward uh, with a commercial rent support for businesses because uh, businesses, uh, we need them to be able to come uh, back strongly after this uh, pandemic is through or after uh, this phase of the lockdown is through. Um, but we uh, recognize that uh, oh, this is a difficult time for everyone and we are looking to try and help. Uh, but the CERB uh, and the wage subsidy uh, will go a significant distance towards helping uh, many, many Canadians get through this difficult time. Sure. Carissa? Yeah, the only thing that I would add, it's a really good question. And I think it's also important for landlords to understand that these are exceptional times in our country and now is a time for all Canadians to stick together and support each other. So if you have a tenant who has lost income because of coronavirus, now is a time to be really compassionate. That is the way that you support your neighbors and your country in this difficult time. And it's also a time for banks to be really thoughtful about the mortgages that those landlords have to pay. We're going to get through this and we will get through it by supporting each other and acting together. Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. Prime Minister, we know that the federal stockpile did not have adequate supplies of personal protective equipment. I'm wondering what Canadians and medical workers should be able to expect from the stockpile for the next pandemic. The national stockpile is in place to supplement uh, the stockpiles that provinces need to have across the country to deal with uh, emergencies that could arise. As we've seen through this pandemic, uh, both at the provincial level and the national level, uh, we should have had more. We needed to have more. That's why we've been working so incredibly hard over these past weeks uh, to source uh, personal protective equipment and necessary medical supplies from around the world. And uh, we have largely been been successful in meeting the need uh, of Canadians right across the country. But it took an awful lot of scrambling, an awful lot of effort that uh, ideally wouldn't have had to happen. Uh, so there are certainly uh, lessons to be learned going forward as we ensure that uh, stockpiles are adequate, both at the provincial and the federal level. Uh, and uh, that will be certainly one of the things that has been learned through this, uh, this pandemic. On top of that, uh, in terms of uh, domestic procurement, we are seeing seeing uh, local uh, manufacturers, domestic manufacturers, uh, step up in significant ways to ensure that uh, we have the equipment needed, uh, not just for medical, uh, medical professionals on the front lines now, but as we look towards a reopening economy that will require uh, more PPE uh, across many sectors. So what does that actually mean as for your federal commitment? Does that mean you will stockpile it for a certain number of weeks going forward? Will you mandate this? Will you put into legislation? What are you actually committing it will look like going forward? Right now, our commitment is to help Canadians going through this pandemic right now uh, with the equipment they need, uh, with the support they need, and our focus is entirely on uh, filling those needs as quickly as possible. Uh, there will, of course, uh, need to be very careful reflections about how we make sure that if this ever happens again, we are much better prepared. Uh, that is something that we are all going to be committed to. It is something that Canadians will expect and something that this government will do. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse aujourd'hui.
Thank you. That concludes today's press conference. Thank you. Okay, and that is the Prime Minister of Canada, accompanied by a number of cabinet ministers and the Deputy Prime Minister, to uh, introduce uh, something unusual at this time, because this is the time where we would normally get an update from the government on their response to COVID-19, to the pandemic. Uh, but today, uh, they chose to use this time to uh, talk about a decision to restrict uh, 1,500 what they call military-style military uh, weapons in this country. They say that immediately uh, you will no longer be able to buy, sell, transport, import, or use military-grade assault weapons in this country. For people that already have some of these weapons, you will have a two-year amnesty to get rid of them in a safe way. Uh, and the government says there will be legislation to follow with some sort of buyback program. Uh, that has yet to be determined, but that the move today by the government is being done by regulation, which means that it is a decision from cabinet, it is effective immediately, and there is no uh, ability or need for parliament to get involved or debate this question. Uh, so let's get some reaction from the leader of the official opposition about this now, because important to get his voice here uh, on this on this move. Uh, Conservative leader Andrew Shear joins me now here from Ottawa. Good to see you, Mr. Shear. So th this was something Something that the government uh, committed to during the election campaign that they were going to move forward with uh, a ban on assault weapons. They have done that today, and um, the prime minister said he he spoke to you and other opposition leaders about your support uh, or support that would be needed moving forward. So I'll just maybe start by getting your reaction to what the government's announced today. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we think it's completely inappropriate to make this kind of major policy change at a time when uh, Parliament has been effectively shut down by the Liberal government. Uh, we're not able to hold the government to account to, to uh, you know, use question period to, to make points on this policy announcement. And doing it at a time when uh, Canadians are very concerned about this pandemic, uh, we, we believe is completely unacceptable. Uh, we, we know that uh, what the Liberal approach always is, is to ask law-abiding firearms owners to follow more laws. Uh, that's lazy and ineffective government, but we believe that the focus should be on uh, illegally trafficked firearms and criminal organizations who smuggle in weapons and, and, uh, and, and put them into our community. Okay, uh, to your first point about being able to debate it and discuss it, I, I, I take your point, but this is something that they would have done through regulations anyway. The legislation isn't needed. So what, in, in what way could you have influenced, I guess, the conversation moving forward? Well, look, we're, we're operating in an environment right now where the House of Commons isn't sitting. Uh, parliamentarians don't have the avenues, uh, like question period, to uh, challenge government policies. You're correct in pointing out that this is something that they did without legislation. Uh, but the context that we're in is certainly unique. You know, the House of Commons is not sitting normally. Uh, they're, and they're using this pandemic uh, as a way to, to bring in a major policy decision. Uh, we think that's completely unacceptable. And we should be focused right now on, on the pandemic pandemic, getting people mm -hmm. through the health crisis of it. And now is not the time to make these types of major policy changes, especially when they're proven to be so ineffective. Okay. Um, it, it, I, I just want to ask you about the buyback legislation. So this is something that would have to be legislated, would have to go through the regular parliamentary process. And because you're in this limited format, sitting only one time in person during the week and two other virtual sessions, it won't happen now. Uh, what, what, what would be your first thought about that, that, that a buyback program, I guess, has to make sense for the, the legal gun owner who will have to turn over their weapon after two years? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, I think we're a long way from talking about legislation right now. The House of Commons is still uh, not sitting. Uh, the motion that was passed means that the government can only bring forward bills related to the coronavirus response. Yes. Uh, what we would like to see in legislation is, are real measures to go after illegal uh, and smuggled firearms. The, the overwhelming majority of homicides in Canada are committed by smuggled firearms. Uh, Solomon Friedman, who is an expert on the Firearms Act, has said that uh, effective gun control is essential, but uh, gun control theater is worthless. And what we see with the Liberals time and time again is to, to take people who follow all the rules and follow all the guidelines and make them follow more laws. Uh, criminals will not 
be bothered by which category a fire a, a gun that they purchased illegally off the streets uh, they're not going to care which category a firearm falls into or not uh, we, we were coming off the heels of a tragedy in Nova Scotia uh, the shooter in Nova Scotia did not have a license every single one of his firearms were illegal and that obviously did not stop the, the, the tragedy so going after people who traffic in firearms who smuggle in firearms who illegally modify firearms uh, in terms of sawing off shotguns mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. rifles that is what, what will actually save lives in this country and what the liberals are doing is uh, is just symbolism over substance so uh, the the public safety minister during that press conference I'm not sure if you heard he, he did confirm that two of the long guns used by the Nova Scotia shooter w would uh, now appear on this list of banned uh, assault weapons um, we know that it, uh, one of the weapons was from Canada others came from the United States and you're quite right he did not have a license but Bill Blair's point during that press conference was that every legal weapon ends up illegal at some point and uh, if you shut down access to these kinds of weapons that are primarily used to 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 kill people or target practice uh, you know that that, that at least uh, allows you to better protect people potentially because they're just not floating around uh, in society do you not agree with that that there is some benefit to these weapons just not being available in Canada well the point I would make is that the government has limited resources and police officers have limited time. So if we're going to allocate police, precious limited police time and resources, wh what is the most effective way to keep dangerous guns off our streets? We know that uh, many handguns that are used committing in crimes are illegal, period. Uh, we know that when they're smuggled over, they're obviously illegal. When someone doesn't have a license, every firearm is illegal. So going after the smugglers, going after uh, you know, shipments coming into Canada for mm -hmm. better inspections, that's where we believe the allocation should be made. It's easy but lazy government to ask people who follow all the rules to follow some more rules. It's harder to go after criminal organizations and to uh, inspect shipments coming into our ports, yeah, but that I, I, is yeah. where those resources I, should be spent. I, I take your point, and it, it did sound like there, they, there was an acknowledgement that more needs to be done at the border as well. But I, I, I wouldn't mind you conceding my point that if there are fewer guns, then that makes it harder for criminals to obtain those guns. I mean, that's just that's just logic. And it also would seem to me, Mr. Shear, that that you can do all those things. You can do the things that you are suggesting, and you can have a ban on assault weapons. Well, you may want me to concede your point, Rosie, but I'm going to continue to uh, make the point that what's the, the, the firearms that are responsible for the overwhelming number of homicides in this country are illegally shipped, illegally trafficked, and that's where our attention should be turned. Uh, we, we've seen guns being, uh, firearms being classified in different ways. Criminals mm -hmm. who are you know, sh transporting a, a shipment of, of, of narcotics from one part of Ontario to another are not worried about what classification their firearm falls into. And uh, people who are intent, bent on doing evil, uh, again, if they don't have a license to begin with, it's not going to stop uh, these types of tragedies. But going after elite, illegally fired, uh, illegally trafficked, uh, illegally shipped firearms, that will make a difference. Uh, our plan, we support common sense effective measures to keep firearms out of the hands of dangerous individuals, including uh, more effective screening, more tools and resources to law enforcement yeah. and our border agents. So uh, let me just end on this. What, what can you do then? I, I would imagine that there will be uh, legal gun owners who, who will not be happy with this announcement today, who may want to challenge it uh, in front of a court. Would, would you support uh, a, a court challenge if it came about uh, by a citizens group, by a gun, legal gun owners? What, what is your avenue forward here? Well, I'll leave it to individual firearms owners and, and firearms groups to, to, to make those decisions. We as a political party are, are offering Canadians an alternative. We had a major plank in our recent election platform on making our community safer that focused on illegally trafficked firearms, criminal organizations, additional resources to our police forces across the country. That We are going to continue to advocate for that and in the next election you know, we're, we're going to be hopeful that Canadians choose for common sense, uh, for common sense firearms legislation that actually removes guns and illegal weapons from the hands of criminals. Okay, Mr. Shear, good of you to make the time today. I do appreciate it, sir.
Thank you very much. That's the leader of the Conservative Party, Andrew Scheer, here in Ottawa from his home. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left all here on CBC's main network, but I'll bring back Vashi Capellis and uh, Catherine Cullen just for a quick take before I have to take a quick break, and then we'll bring you both back. Uh, so lots there, certainly, and, and I understand Mr. Scheer's position, and I think it'll be one that uh, other Canadians will have as well. But um, this, is a, this is a big move to do uh, through regulations to, to ban these weapons. Uh, Vashi, I only have about 30 seconds. Oh boy. Okay. Yes, it's a big move. There are political consequences to it. A lot of people who voted Liberal, especially in urban areas, want to see this. The argument Mr. Shear puts forth, though, especially around the nature, the way in which the guns in Nova Scotia were used, uh, were acquired illegally, does also beg some questions of the government about timing here. Yeah. And uh, 10 seconds to you or so. 20 seconds, maybe, Catherine. I guess the question I still have out of all of this is it's not clear to me whether or not the government's uh, campaign promise is going to be honored that they are going to introduce a buyback for all mili military style mm -hmm. assault rifles. Uh, not to say that they won't, but I think that's just still a question that, uh, that yes. we will want to see the answer Legislation to. to come. Okay, thank Indeed. you both very much. We'll talk to you both in just a moment. I'm Rosemary Barton. We'll wrap up our coverage here on CBC Television. It was mostly about this gun control measures introduced by the government today, but we'll have lots more news ahead still on CBC News Network and streaming of course, on cbc.ca. Thank you for watching. I'm Rosemary Barton here in Ottawa.